Good morning, everybody. We're going to get into the word today. Father, we thank you for all of your goodness and all of your mercy to us. Lord, now as we enter into a day's rest, Lord, give rest to all of our pastors, all of our staff. Father, they worked hard in your harvest field this weekend. Lord, we thank you for all the people you poured out the Spirit upon. Jesus, we thank you that you continue to honor the promise and you, you pour out the Holy Spirit that you receive from the Father. And you've touched people and you've changed people, Lord. And there's a whole new supernatural dynamic coming to their lives. Lord, we value, we value that outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We recognize, Lord, that we need that touch of the supernatural. We need the gifts of the Spirit flowing in our everyday lives. We need that flow of the river. Father, open our hearts now to your word. Touch our hearts and touch our minds to understand. In Jesus' name, amen. We're starting to make up a little bit of ground. Let's pick up a chapter 15, verse 1. Now, folks, I just want to just come back one more time and remind you of the last two things we ended with because I was kind of rushing. Verse 31 of 14, Jesus reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, he said, why did you doubt me? And when they climbed back into the boat, you know what? Jesus helped him walk on the water back to the boat. Jesus didn't carry him. Jesus grabbed him. But he still walked on water back to the boat, only this time holding on to Jesus. Okay. So, you know, we can make fun of Peter if we want. I, no, thank you. He walked on the water twice, once going out to Jesus and once hanging on to Jesus coming back. But then I also want you to notice that the testimony of a woman multiplied as this woman had shared the woman with the issue of blood. I touched the hem of his garment and I got healed. All of a sudden, other people had faith to receive the same way. Testimonies are very powerful, very powerful in, in spreading faith. All right, chapter 15, verse one. Some Pharisees and the teachers of the law now arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus. Now, this is a long trip. They came all the way from Jerusalem to Galilee to see Jesus. Now, you're talking a long trip. If you've driven that with us, you know what a long trip that is. They ask him, why do your disciples disobey our age-old tradition? For they ignore our tradition of ceremonial hand washing before they eat. So, long trip just to criticize. And I guess that's one of the things that amazes me with people, how much effort people will make to be critical. Now, you know, sometimes you look at this and you go, wow, these people went through a lot of effort just, just to come there and criticize. Now, notice, it's not disobedience of the word. This is not disobedience of the word. This is a disobedience of our age-old tradition for they ignore our tradition of ceremonial hand washing before they eat. Now, even today, if you go with us to Israel and you walk into the um, restaurant at the um, hotel in Tiberias, you'll see right outside the restaurant, there's sinks with two handled, um, it, it looks like a big cup like this, only it's not this big and it has a handle on both sides. You grasp the handle on one side, pour water over one hand. You grasp the handle on the other side and pour water on the other hand. That's their ceremony. And he said, it, now, God never said this, but this was their tradition. And it's amazing how people will fight for traditions. Now, I like what Brother John said to me one time on the phone. He said, the the hardest traditions to get rid of are the traditions that have been passed down to us by the people who love us and who we love. Parents pass on traditions to us. Grandparents pass on traditions to us. But it has nothing to do with the Word of God. The closer you are to a person and the more you love them, the harder it is to give up a man-made tradition. Jesus replied, why do you by your traditions. Now notice, he did not answer their charge. 
he did not answer their charge against the disciples. He never answered the charge. Now, now sometimes you're going to have to learn. There's no point in trying to explain why you don't do a tradition. <laughs> okay. I mean, a tradition is something people are very emotionally, this, this is an emotional attachment. Traditions have a very strong emotional attachment and trying to answer the charges that are emotionally charged are impossible. So Jesus did not answer their emotionally attached tradition, but he challenged them, okay? He turns the tables. He turns the tables on them. Why do you, by your tradition, violate the direct commandments of God? For instance, now Jesus illustrates. He didn't just charge, he illustrated the charge. He said, for instance, God says, honor your father and mother, and anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father and mother must be put to death. But you say, it is all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you, for I vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. In this way, you say you don't need to honor your parents. And so you cancel the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. You hypocrites. Now, let's just back up and look at this for a second. For instance, if we had told our parents, mom, dad, I'm going to help you 2000 a month. And then you make a vow for the Remain Project, or you make a vow for missions. And now you say, mom, dad, I can't help you with 2000 a month anymore because I've made a vow to the building project. Now, Jesus would say, that's not right. But he said, because of your traditions, you cancel or nullify the word of God. He said, you hypocrites. He said, again, you actors. You act all religious. You Facebook Jews, okay? But if you want to say, if you want to talk about hypocrisy, just consider it Facebook lifestyle, okay? What you present, it's an act. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands of gods. Now, this is quoted by Jesus, and this is quoted by Paul. This is a common charge against that generation. Now notice, worship is a farce, it's fake. For they teach man-made ideas as the commands of God. Now, beloved, you're gonna have to, th th this, is, this is a mandate for preaching. When you start searching Google for something to say in a sermon, and you're not teaching line by line the scriptures, you're not studying the Bible, you're going to come up with a lot of weird things to say, man-made ideas. You hear a lot of these sermons that are being taught these days. It's a sermon titles, and this is a common title for sermons today. It's okay to not be okay. Where did they get that? Where did they get that? Did that come from the word or did that come from a man-made idea? Now, you, you look at culture. I can remember walking into a church one time in the West, and their platform was decorated in a Batman theme. And I realized their whole series was about Batman, how Batman illustrates the scriptures. And I'm just sitting there going, you must be joking. But the church was full of people. The church was full of people, full, full house. You, you're going to have to make up your mind if you're going to be a real man or a real woman of God. You don't get your ideas for sermons from the world. You teach the word. Everything must flow from the word. Then Jesus called to the crowd to come and hear. All right, now, now audience changes. The Pharisees are still there. 
But Jesus looks up and speaks to the larger crowd. Now he's speaking to the larger crowd. He said, listen and try to understand. Okay, so effort needed to learn. Try to understand. It is not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. Whoa. Now here's the principle. Then the disciples came and said, do you realize you offended the Pharisees by what you just said? So Jesus stood up and told everybody, you don't have to wash your hands with the ceremonial washing. This is not a sanitary thing. You don't have to do the ceremonial hand washing before you eat, because it's not what goes into you that defiles you. It's what comes out of you that defiles you. So he has just taught. He offended them by overturning their tradition. Now, people are going to be offended when you don't follow their traditions. Jesus replied, every plant not planted by my heavenly Father will be uprooted. So ignore them. Here is, the, here is another principle. They are blind guides leading the blind. And if one blind person guides another, they will both fall into the ditch. Now notice, Jesus didn't say go fight with these people. He said, ignore these people. There are going to be people who attack you. Ignore offended attackers. Ignore them. They will be uprooted. Now notice, uprooted. It's not that they're going to just, you know, it's not, they're not going to stay there and just be around the rest of your life. The, these people will be uprooted. Now, uprooted, there's no nourishment going into them. They just die off. And you're going to find that these offended critics that, that position themselves as so pompous and so holy, you're going to look around one day and you're going to see they're just not there anymore. So you, you don't need to waste your time and energy fighting these people. And he said, they're blind guides, and the only people that they lead are the blind. And he said, the fruit of both of them is they fall into the ditch. In other words, no progress. When you fall into the ditch, you're not on the highway anymore. You're not moving forward on your journey anymore. You're in the ditch. All right. So there's no progress. These people are stalled. No progress. They're left behind. Now, all of a sudden, this is getting clear to you. Then Peter said to Jesus, explain to us the parable that says people aren't defiled by what they eat. Okay, Peter said, hey, I've been hearing this my whole life, Jesus. Okay, he said, please explain. Peter said, my whole life, this is what I've been told to do. And she, Don't you understand yet? Jesus asked. Anything that passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer. We all understand what he's talking about. You eat it, you defecate it, and it goes into the sewer. But the words you speak come from the heart. So your words have a source from the heart. That is what defiles you. For from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. These are what defile you. Eating with unwashed hands will never defile you. All right, so the source, okay, the source of sinful actions, sinful acts and words are the heart. Now, straight up, before a man ever commits adultery, it's been going on in his heart for a long time. Before a young couple who is 
courting ever gets involved in sexual immorality. It's been going on in their heart for a long time. Before somebody steals something, it's been going on in their heart for a while. Before somebody lies, it's been going on in their heart for a while. Before somebody slanders you, people don't stand up and slander you. It's been going on in their heart for a while. So you, you have to understand, when people do sinful actions, it did not just originate that instant. It came from a source. Now, again, you have to, you have to deal with an issue. Treat cause, not symptoms. Treat the cause, not the symptoms. As a pastor, we want to work on people's hearts. You know, you can't just stand up and preach against adultery and sexual immorality and theft and lying and slander. You know, you, you can't just stand up and say these are wrong things to do. You've got to work on where it comes from. This is why you always need to be working on people's hearts, not on their actions, not on the manifestations of their hearts, but on their hearts. So a, a pastoral focus. the hearts of the people, not the actions. You know, I was, evidently there's some Christian who's something who, some couple that just broke up because it's all over Facebook these days about some guy committed adultery and she's divorcing him and all this kind of stuff. Evidently it's some famous Christian couple, I don't know who. But some of the things that come up and it's Christians doing this, because it comes up on my Facebook and it's people who used to be a part of our church and they live in other parts of the world. And they're saying tips on keeping your husband interested in you, how to, to keep your heart focused toward your wife, the things that, and I'm sitting there thinking, you know, all they want to do is treat the symptoms. And they didn't say heart. They said, how do you stay focused on your wife? They don't, they want to deal with the symptoms and they don't want to deal with the root cause. When lust is in the human heart, it's going to manifest. So spend time with Jesus, spend time in the word, spend time with the Holy Spirit and get your heart right. And when the heart is right, you don't need to worry about going out and doing all this stuff. I better stop because I'll start preaching on that. Then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre and Sire. Now that's Tyre and Sidon North, that's like going up toward um, uh, Caesarea. Okay, that's like, that's going up near the gates of hell. A Gentile woman who lived there came pleading, have mercy on me, son of, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. All right, so she knows who Jesus is. She titles him, Lord, son of David. She asks for mercy, which is a prayer that's always answered. She does everything right. And she has a problem. And notice demons torment. Now, one of the things you're going to learn about demons is not all demons are created equal. There are demons that torment severely. There are demons that you hardly recognize that they're there. Okay, but this was a demon that tormented the daughter severely. But Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. Jesus ignored her. Then the disciples urged him to send her away. Tell her to go away, they said. She's bothering us with all her begging. Then Jesus said to the woman, I was only sent to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. This is implementation A focus of ministry. I was only sent to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. Now, one of the things you're going to have to learn to do is that there's a lot of things you can be doing for the kingdom, but who has God told you to focus on? What's the focus? Now, yes, you can help other people from time to time, but have you ever noticed how focused I am on COP? To the point I get criticized by people all the time. You're, you're an isolationist. I'm not an isolationist. I'm just focused. God asked me to care for the people 
uh, what was then Manila at the temple. That's what God asked me to do. And so I've stayed focused on that all of my life. Now, th there's a lot of things you could be busy doing. I mean, and there's a lot of, I mean, if I wanted to go preach other places, I could preach someplace else every day of my life, okay? Standing invitations across Africa, across China, across Australia, Indonesia. I mean, I, I, could, I could start traveling today and, and never come home. But at some point, you've got to realize, what has God asked me to do? Okay, what has God asked me to do? And you have to learn to do what God has asked you to do. So Jesus is implementing the focus of ministry. But she came and she worshipped him. Again, here's faith. This woman recognized Jesus as Messiah. She worshipped him, pleading, Lord, help me. Jesus replied, it isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. In other words, Jesus is still talking about focus of ministry. He said, hey, we don't have enough food. I need to feed the children. Now, again, Jesus is not calling her a dog. This is priority of food. You, you don't take food that's set aside for your children and feed it to your dogs. You feed your children first. This is about prioritization. This is not about being prejudiced. Jesus didn't have a prejudiced bone in his body, okay? This is not about prejudice. This is about Jesus understanding spiritual food. I have a priority. I only have so many hours a day. I only have so much human strength. I have to teach and, and focus and give the food to the children. And he's trying to explain it to this woman with an illustration this woman can understand. You don't take the food off the table for your children, feed it to the dogs. But now notice, this woman understood. She replied, that's true, but even the dogs are allowed to eat the scraps, the leftovers that fall beneath the master's table. Now that shows you what Jesus' illustration about is about. This is not prejudice, and she did not receive it as bigoted. She received it as an illustration, okay? She received the illustration. It was not prejudice. Dear woman, Jesus said to her, your faith is great. Your request is granted. And her daughter was instantly healed. Now look at great faith. Great faith presses in. She just would not be denied. Jesus returned to the Sea of Galilee and climbed a hill and sat down. Climbed a hill and sat down. Do we know what hill? No. Probably sometime, someplace in that area of Magdala, between Magdala and Bethsaida. And, but there's hills all around the Sea of Galilee, but probably not on the other side. The other side was more the Gentile area. He climbed a hill and sat down, and a vast crowd brought to him. Okay, now notice. Again, they came to Jesus. People who were lame, blind, crippled, those who couldn't speak, and many others, and laid them before Jesus, and he healed them all. The crowd was amazed. Those who hadn't been able to speak were talking. The crippled were made well. The lame were walking and the blind could see. And they praised the God of Israel. Then Jesus called his disciples and told them, I feel sorry for these people, for they have been with me for three days and they have nothing to eat. So they're not near a place of food. They're not near one of the villages. Okay, They're not near Capernaum or Bethsaida or Magdala. They're out someplace that's, that's away. Okay, and they've been with Jesus for three days. He said, I don't want to send them away hungry or they will faint along the way. All right, so Jesus cared how people got home. He cared how people got home. Now, as a pastor, you can't just care about getting people to the church. You've got to care about how people get home after church. 
Have you ever noticed when there's floods, when there's something going on, transportation shut down, I end the service early so people can get home? And people get mad at me about it. They say, oh, pastor, where's your faith? And people, I mean, for 42 years, people have criticized me about this. I'm not going to change. A good pastor who's like Jesus cares about the people getting home safely. So Jesus said, we're going to feed these people because physically they need the strength to walk back to their villages. The disciples replied, where would we get enough food here in the wilderness for such a huge crowd? And Jesus asked, how much bread do you have? They replied, seven loaves and a few small fish. So Jesus told the people to sit on the ground. Again, he organized. Now, before you ever pass out food, always organize. People go crazy when you start passing out food, especially when they're hungry. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish and thanked God for them. All right, here's prayer before the meal. Now, traditional Jews today, to this day, pray after the meal. They eat and then they give thanks after the meal. Why do we as Christians pray before the meal? Because that's what Jesus did. He prayed before he served them the meal. Ah, so you're seeing that they're not just traditions we have. There are reasons that we do the things that we do. He took the seven loaves and fish, thanked God for them, broke them into pieces, and gave them. All right, so they were multiplied in his hands just like the last feeding of the multitude. They multiplied in his hands. They didn't multiply in the hands of the apostles, they multiplied in his hands, who distributed the food to the crowd. Remember, miracles of multiplication occur after the giving. You put it in his hands. They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterwards, the disciples picked up seven large basketfuls of leftover food. There were 4,000 men who were fed that day, in addition to all the women and children. So again, you're talking fifteen to 20,000 people fed with seven loaves and a few small fish. And they ate as much as they were wanted. No. Well, let's just put it positively. Always abundant provision. Then Jesus sent the people home. He got into the boat and crossed over to the region of Magadha. Chapter 16, verse 1. One day, the Pharisees and Sadducees came to chest Jesus. All right. Two shows purpose. So the purpose was not to learn. The purpose was not forgiveness. The purpose was to test, demanding that he show them a miraculous sign to prove his authority. Now, again, I ask the question, why not just walk with him? Every place he went, he did miracles. Now, if they really wanted to see miracles, just go hang out with Jesus. But they didn't just want to see miracles. They wanted something special for them. They wanted him to prove something. They wanted them to prove to them. They wanted something special to prove to them. He replied, you know the saying, red sky at night means fair weather tomorrow. Red sky in the morning means foul weather all day. You know how to interpret the weather signs in the sky, but you don't know how to interpret the signs of the times. Only an evil and adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. But the only sign I will give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. And then he went away. Now, what was the sign of the prophet Jonah? His death, burial, and resurrection. And again, this is Jesus's generation, an evil, adulterous generation. 
Later, after they crossed to the other side of the lake, the disciples discovered they had forgotten to bring any bread. Watch out, Jesus warned them. All right, here's another one of these bewares. This should be added to your list. These are things that you need to watch out for. Watch out. Beware. The yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Okay, so remember what yeast is. You put a little bit of it in. The kingdom of God is like yeast. Diva. But the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees is also a yeast. You put a little bit of it in, and it takes over everything. And they began to argue with each other because they hadn't brought bread. Jesus knew what they were saying and said, you have so little faith. Why are you arguing with each other about having no bread? Don't you even understand yet? Now, I want you to notice an incredible principle here. The focus of your thoughts affects your understanding of truth. They're thinking about bread. So when Jesus talks about yeast, they can't see past the lack of bread. Now, one of the things you have to learn to do with people is get their attention off of their problems. This is why I would never want to try and preach before worship. Because people walk into the auditorium, their minds full of all of their problems. And because their minds are full of all of their problems, everything you teach them is going to be interpreted through the lens of their problems. It's just like putting on, you know, some of the young people wear these funny colored sunglasses, sunnies or something, they're pink, they're yellow, they're blue, whatever. And everything is tinted by, by the glass, the color of the glass they're looking through. The brain is the same way. Everything you hear is tinted by what the focus of your mind is right now. So they began to argue with each other because they hadn't brought any bread. All right. Why do Christians argue? Because of need. Why do families argue? Because of need. You show me any family that has financial problems, and I'll show you a family that's arguing. When there's plenty of money, nobody's arguing. One of the great solutions for family peace is prosperity. As families have the bills paid, as they have enough money for the tuitions, as Morelka was paid, as they've got some money in the bank, they've got food in the refrigerator, as people have their needs met, they don't argue as much. They began to argue with each other because of a need. Jesus knew what they were saying, so he said, you have so little faith, all right? Little faith argues. <laughs> Why are you arguing with each other about having no bread? Okay, okay, please. Not logical. Don't you understand even yet? Don't you remember the 5,000 I fed with five loaves and the basketfuls of leftovers you picked up? Or the 4,000 I fed with seven loaves and the large baskets of leftovers you picked up? Why can't you understand I am not talking about bread? I, so, I, again, I say, beware the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, when people are misinterpreting what you're saying because they're, looking, they're listening to what you're saying through the lens of their own problems, you have to bring them back, say it again. Okay? So, little faith argues, little faith does not understand. Then at last they understood. He wasn't talking about the yeast and bread, but about the deceptive teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, Pharisees would be conservative teaching. Sadducees would be liberal teaching. But you have to understand that teaching is a yeast. Teaching about the kingdom 
is a yeast and false. And, and that, let's not use the word false. Let's use wrong teaching. Wrong teaching is a yeast. Teaching is a yeast. You put a little bit of teaching into one person in the family, and it works through everybody in the family. You put a little bit of teaching into a barcada, and before long, the whole barcada is affected by that teaching. You put a little teaching, a wrong teaching, into a cell group, a connect group, and before long, the whole connect group has wrong teaching. It is a yeast. It changes the group, okay? It changes the group. Now, this is why Paul comes to Timothy and says, now, stop this wrong teaching. Now, we always want to talk about false teaching and all this kind of stuff, you know, and we want to look at it as demonic, demonic, demonic. But there's a lot of things. It's not demonic. There are demons of doctrines, but they're also just wrong teachings of men. And these wrong teachings of men are usually a little more insidious. They're, they work their way in because it doesn't look so evil, okay? You know, when I, when I think of all the people who don't believe in women in ministry, and I, I think of good women who just sit in a corner and do nothing because they were taught when they were a child, women should never speak in church. <laughs> you know, when I, I think of all the people who don't believe in the doctrines of healing, the doctrines of prosperity, the doctrines of salvation by grace. A little bit of teaching got into somebody, and it spread. It's very important that we learn to be careful. And what Jesus is trying to say is, be careful of your diet. Be careful of your diet. You know, you're going to find there's not a lot of preachers that I will listen to. Now, there are preachers that are really, really good, and I will listen to them. But these guys that are getting a little off, or I don't just sit around and bored them at home and listen to strange teachings coming out of Davao or strange teachings, you know, coming out of Korea. There's some really weird guys in Korea. I don't listen to a bunch of this stuff. I don't li When I see a guy going off, I don't listen to it anymore. Because that teaching is a yeast. It's dangerous. Beware of it. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, now this is up there uh, in the north area when you go up with us to the gates of hell and you go up to the, well, up to the river up there, which is the, the source area of the uh, Sea of Galilee. When you go up there with us, this is what we're talking about. And Caesarea Philippi is basically... There's there's not much there. This is this is a, a this is not a big area, then or now. He asked his disciples, "Who do people say that the Son of Man is?" Now notice he's in the region of Caesarea Philippi. The only thing up there in those days was something called the Gates of Hell. This is the Temple of Pan. It's a demon god that the Romans and the Greeks worship. It's where we get the word panic from. It's where we get the word pandemonium from. He, he's a demon of fear, and he really likes to go after women. Panic attack. All of this comes from this demon god, Pan, and he's worshipped up there. And if you go with us up there, we'll, we'll, we'll walk you right up to this hole, this, this big cave in the side of this mountain. And people would come from all over that part of the world, and they'd bring their child, and they would throw their child alive into this thing. Now, if blood came out, it meant that the sacrifice was accepted. If no blood came out with the water, it meant the sacrifice was not accepted, and they would have to offer another child. It was a place of child sacrifice. So here's Jesus up there, and he sees all these people walking right by him. I never understood this passage until we got up there and saw it. All these people walking right by him, the Son of God who's being given by the Father for the sins of man. He is the sacrifice. 
And instead, he watches all these people taking their babies and sacrificing their babies. And they're just walking right by him to go worship a demon. No wonder Jesus asked, who do people say that the Son of Man is? How can these people walk right by me like this? Who do they think I am? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, Jesus is having a heart check here because he sees up in this area, he has no popularity at all. Everybody just walks right by him. So this is a heart check. This is a leadership heart check. If you're going to carry the gospel, if you're going to continue this work that I'm starting, Jesus is saying, you know, are, are you going to get caught up in this also? Who do you say that I am? Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. All right, revelation. Revelation knowledge needed. Not just somebody told this to you. Revelation is needed. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. And all, and rock here is little. And all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now all the powers, this is the gate, this literally means the gates of hell. The gates of hell shall not conquer it. Jesus is prophesying about the future of the gates of hell. This translation needs a little bit of work in here. The gates of hell will not overcome it. If you go there today, the gates of hell is empty and forgotten. And Jesus, his message, what he did for mankind is everywhere in the world. So you have to understand, there are times you look around at false prophets and you look around at false doctrines and you look around at the demonic and you go, why is this stuff so popular? That demonic stuff will never overpower the kingdom of God. What Jesus has done has life in it. What demons do has no life in it. He said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Now the translation says, whatever you imprison on earth will be imprisoned in heaven. And whatever you allow on earth will be allowed in heaven. So in other words, there is spiritual authority. flowing from the revelation. And I had to be careful or I'll spend an hour on this passage because I was just studying it yesterday and it's, it's amazing. Like the little word here for on, the root word for on here literally means immediately. Whatever you forbid immediately on earth will be immediately forbidden in heaven. It has a sense that the root word has the idea of almost an instantaneously thing happening. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Now, why would he do that? Because revelation is needed. Now, we're making progress. Chapter 16, verse 21. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to, number one, go to Jerusalem. Number two, he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, the teachers of the religious law. Number three, that he would be killed. Number four, he would be raised from the dead. Plain teaching. Plainly. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. These elders, leading priests, teachers of the law, I'm going to suffer a lot of things at their hands. I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again on the third day. Plain teaching. Now, every time I see this plain teaching, and I think of all the times from this point forward that Jesus taught the disciples that he would suffer, die, and rise again, I always ask myself the question, 
why in the world were they not all sitting out there at the tomb, camped out around a campfire, waiting for the resurrection? And you had to be confronted with the fact that grief makes you forget. Grief makes you forget. And then Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him. Wow. Correcting Jesus. For saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. <laughs> no. You know, Peter loved, Peter loved Jesus. People who love you never want to think about you having to suffer. Now, young pastors, your parents love you. And when they recognize that you're going to have to go through some suffering in the ministry, they don't want those things to happen. People who love you don't want to see you hurt. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. Oh. You are not, you are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Now, when people love you and they don't want you to ever hurt, they don't want you to ever go through anything hard, it's a trap. It's a demonic trap. Now, was, was Peter Satan possessed at this point? Of course not. But when you when people speak the world's viewpoint, that is Satan's viewpoint. That's how Satan thinks. This is incredible temptation coming to him. Again, Satan, remember, offered Jesus the throne without the cross. Remember, I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. Jesus, Satan was offered, Satan offered Jesus the destiny of ruling this world without the sufferings. And here it comes again. You don't need to go through these sufferings. So it's, it's, it's again, a return to the temptation in the wilderness. Now, one of the things you're going to have to get a hold of is when people start coming up to you saying, oh, you know, you should want an easy life. You know, you want, you've got to have a work-life balance. You've got to have this. You've got to have that. And they start talking to you about, you know, no sacrifice for the ministry. And, you know, you want to have a good life. When they start talking to you like that, understand, <laughs> excuse me, that's the world's viewpoint. All gain with no pain. But I'm sorry. The kingdom of God forcefully advances. That means there's going to be some effort and there's going to be some pain put out. You know, you, you can sit around in a church of 100 people and, and 20 years later still have 100 people and, you know, you've had your nice life. I was talking with the pastors in uh, Ghana a few years ago, and they were laughing because they said, your stories are our stories. Because they have good pastors in Ghana that could build a great church in Ghana. But instead, they go to America, and they work at a 7-Eleven, and they have a little church, a little African church of 25 or 30 people, and they spend their whole life doing nothing. And I said, yeah, we have, we have pastors from the Philippines that do the same thing. And work in 7-Eleven, and they have a little church of 50 or 75 people, and that's it. The kingdom of God forcefully advances. There's going to have to be some pain to get the gain. You're going to have to put some sacrifice in. So if, if you're looking for work-life balance, you are in the wrong place because the ministry is all about sacrifice. And if you're be that corn of wheat and fall to the ground and die, you will bring forth much fruit. But as long as you're seeking to hang on to your own life, forgive me, you're, you're never going to have anything. So again, th this is an incredible temptation coming back at Jesus from someone who loves him. 
Remember, just because they love you doesn't mean it's right. Get a hold of that. Just because somebody loves you doesn't mean that their viewpoint is right. Let me say that again. Just because somebody loves you doesn't mean their viewpoint is right. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any one of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Give up your own plans. Give up your own destiny. Give up your own way. Take up your cross. This is God's will for your life. Now, don't take up Jesus's cross. Take up your cross, God's will for your life, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. Folks, one of the things you're going to have to figure out about God is he's not a user. But if you'll sacrifice and you'll, 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 you'll pay the price, there will come a day when God gives you abundantly beyond anything you could ask or imagine. And you're going to look around at your life and you're going to go, why am I so stinking blessed? Why has all this been? Look at God. Why? Look, look at what you've done for me. Yes, in my life, it took, you know, all these years to get to where I am. But you know what? I have no regrets. Yeah, there was a lot of sacrifice that went in. But look at the abundance that God gives me now. Now, you guys are going to have to get a hold of this. These people who want to come along and tell you, oh, no sacrifice for the ministry. Oh, you could have a nice life. You can have your BGC lifestyle and your foodie adventures and everything will be easy and wonderful. You know what? Those guys will never, those guys will never accomplish much in their life. The kingdom of God forcefully advances. How did Jesus birth this thing? By his sacrifice. How does this thing grow? By sacrifice. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Is there anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge all the people according to their deeds. I tell you the truth. Some standing here right now will not die until they see the Son of Man coming in their kingdom. Now, that's one of those verses in the Bible I have multiple question marks next to in multiple Bibles. Okay. I just, what? People try to make this the um, uh, Mount of Transfiguration. I, I mean, I've read all the, please, I've studied all this stuff. I still have never seen anything that I yet understand. Now we get into the Mount of Transfiguration. That's why some people say that that's what this is about. Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, the sons of thunder, and led them up a high mountain to be alone. All right. Alone time. Now, I have never been up on the Mount of Transfiguration because we can't get buses up there. But one of these days, I keep promising myself every time I go to Israel, I want to go up there. You know, you can get a small little vehicle and get up there. I want to get up there because it's quite high. Uh, they'll point it to you as you drive by it on the highway. That's the Mount of Transfiguration. And you can see that was a pretty steep mountain that Jesus climbed. Not real tall, but steep. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed. Now, the word there for transform means what was inside came out. So that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. Now notice. The dead are still alive. <laughs> the dead are still alive. Again, this goes right in the face of the false doctrine of the Sadducees that there is no resurrection. There is no life after death. The Sadducees taught that when you die, you cease to exist. That's why people who believe that live very sinful lives because they think there's no consequences. Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. 
<laughs> I like Peter. If I was there, I would have done the same, the same thing. Jesus, what can I do? <laughs> but even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Um, listen to him. The disciples were terrified and fell down on the earth. Now notice, teaching on the Trinity, you have the Father and the Son present at the same time. But notice the great lesson. Sometimes just listen. Sometimes there's nothing to do except listen. And you know what? That's one of the hardest things to do when you see something and you're excited and you want to do something to help. But sometimes you just have to learn to sit and listen. And notice the father's attitude. This is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Jesus gave the father joy. And this is my prayer. When the father looks at me, I don't want to just be like Jesus in other ways. I want to be like Jesus in this way also. Father, when you look at my life, may my life bring you great joy. I know that he loves me. I mean, please. But Lord, let my life bring you great joy. And that's a prayer that you need to learn to begin to pray in your, in your devotional life every day. Father, let my life bring you great joy. Every time you look at me, Father, may there be a smile upon your face. Oh, be careful, I'm going to get caught up in praying here in a minute. Then Jesus came over and touched them. <laughs> Jesus just came over, laid his hand on them. I mean, can you imagine this experience? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be on the ground too. <laughs> Jesus came over, touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus. As they went back down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Now, again, he's teaching about the resurrection, and he just gave them a great illustration about life after death, okay? And the illustration of life after death. Okay, they saw Elijah and Moses. They saw the illustration. He said, listen, when I've been raised from the dead. Now, listen to how they answer that. As they went back down the mountain, Jesus said, don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Then one of his disciples asked him, one of these three guys with him, why do the teachers of the religious law insist that Elijah must return before Messiah comes? Now notice, now we're dealing with a question, a question of the heart. This is anti-Jesus doctrines. See, we, we get this idea that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, just let, just let Jesus be this great speaker and just let John be these great speakers and get all this attention focused on them. I got news for you. No, they were sending out white papers, so to speak. They were, they were instructing rabbis in the synagogues. What were they were to say to counteract Jesus and to counteract John the Baptist. Now we'll get to John the Baptist later, but so they were teaching this cannot be the Messiah because the scriptures say Elijah must come first. And everybody would sit there in the synagogue and nod their head. Yes, the Bible does say Elijah must come first. This was their talking point against Jesus. Now, at some point, talking points have to be answered. And Jesus answered the talking point with his, these three men. Jesus replied, Elijah indeed is coming first to get everything ready. But I tell you, Elijah has already come but he wasn't recognized. They chose to abuse him, and in the same way, they will make the Son of Man suffer. Then the disciples realized he was talking about John the Baptist. Now notice, how did religion treat 
John the Baptist. He was not popular. He was not popular with religious leaders. They abused him. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes we get this idea that they fought Jesus, but John the Baptist, no, they didn't. No, 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 no. When, when a, a new move of God comes and the voice of God is speaking fresh in the world, they fight it. So they abused John the Baptist. And Jesus said, they didn't recognize. Elijah already came, but they're too blind to see. So he answers the talking points against him. At the foot of the mount, a large crowd was waiting for them. A man came and knelt before Jesus said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. All right. Misplaced face. If people come to COP because I brought my child to Pastor Summerall and he couldn't heal him. Excuse me. I brought my child to Benny Hinn, but he couldn't heal him. Excuse me. I brought my child to Pastor Dag, but he couldn't heal him. Excuse me. Your faith is in the wrong place. You don't bring a sick person or a demon-possessed person to the disciple. You bring them to Jesus. Jesus said, you faithless and corrupt generation. Wow. Faithless and corrupt. How long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? How long must I be with you? And how long must I put up with you? This is Jesus' generation. So did Jesus ever get frustrated? Yeah. He got frustrated with people. See, we get this idea that Jesus walked around in this serene, just, I'm in the zone, D, I'm in the zone. Listen to him. He said, you faithless, corrupt people. How long must I be with you? How much longer do I got to stay on this earth? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon and the boy, and it left him. And from that moment, the boy was well. Now, Jesus is frustrated. He knows his time is short. He's just been talking to him. I mean, he's just come out of this incredible thing with Elijah and Moses, and they've had this wonderful conversation on the mountain. And ah, grave talaga. Talk about coming back down to reality. And he's frustrated. Afterwards, the disciples ask him privately, why couldn't we cast out that demon? You don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. <laughs> I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you would say to this mountain, move from here, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. Now, you know, I look at that and I go, Jesus, I don't have the faith of a mustard seed. I've never spoken to Mount Pinatubo and made it move. I've never spoken to the Al Volcano and made it move. Anybody here ever done that? And all it takes is the faith the size of a mustard seed. I have mustard seeds right here on my desk to remind me this is, this is how big faith has to be to do great miracles. Go, Lord, maybe I got a tenth of a mustard seed. Now, another one of the Gospels puts in, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. So obviously, fasting has something to do with faith also, but that's for another one of the Gospels. After they gathered again in Galilee, Jesus told them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He will be killed. Right, so he's going to be betrayed. He will be killed. On the third day, he will be raised from the dead, and the disciples were filled with grief. Now, again, the future. How many times are we going to see this? And again, notice grief flows from future events. And I sat down with a family one time, 
and I looked at the, the family and the grandparents were in their late 70s. And I was looking at the children and the grandchildren. And I said, you know, one day Lolo and Lola are going to go to heaven. And immediately some of the grandchildren burst into tears. And the parents said, stop crying. They're not dead yet. But I thought of this passage. When you think about future pain, grief can flow. That's a truth to get a hold of for a while. On their arrival in Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and asked him, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, Peter replied. Then he went into the house. Before he had a chance to speak, Jesus said, what do you think, Peter? Do kings tax their own people or the people they've conquered? They tax the people they've conquered, Peter replied. Well then, Jesus said, the citizens are free. <laughs> In other words, Jesus said, no, I don't pay the temple tax. I'm the son of God. It's my father's house. Now, the temple tax is not the tithe. The temple tax is a tax that was put on every citizen to maintain the temple. Well, then, the citizens are free. However, we don't want to offend them. All right, so Jesus did things, unneeded things, so not to offend. Now, folks, we offend people enough with truth, okay? There are things in life that we can do or not do so as not to offend people. So don't always push your rights, okay? Do I have the right to have a Mercedes Benz? Sure. Other people in the church have Mercedes Benz. Why can't I have one? But am I going to drive a Mercedes Benz? No. Why? It offends people. Why, why do I want to go offend people? You offend people enough when you need to with teaching. You don't need to offend people over needless things. So go down to the lake, throw in a line, <laughs> which is funny to me. Open the mouth of the first fish you catch, and you will find a large silver coin. That will take it and pay the temple tax for both of us. Now, I want you to look at this. Peter is a fisherman. He does not fish with a line. He fishes with a net. He's a professional fisherman. Now Jesus is saying, act like a sport fisherman. Just notice how Jesus said, you're not going to get this by your profession. You're not going to go down there, catch a whole bunch of fish, and then pay the temple tax. Okay, so this is, this is not returning to profession to meet a need. Well, you know, I'm going to go back to my career to meet my financial needs. I've got to pay the temple tax. I'm going to return. I'm going to go catch a bunch of fish and then pay my debt. Jesus said, no, no, no. This, this, is, this is going to be like everything else, supernatural. He said, throw in your line. Catch the fish. Now, that fish is a tilapia. We know tilapias very well. Tilapias are a mouth breeder. They, they keep their babies in their mouth. And when they don't have babies in their mouth, they carry little stones or little shiny things in their mouth. Tilapias love to have something in their mouth. Jesus do this. He said, this will be a supernatural provision. Then take it and pay the tax for both of us. So again, I've heard this passage preached. You know, there are times that Jesus tells you to go back to fishing because you've got to meet a financial need. No. He said, Go throw one line in the water, Peter. I know you're a professional fisherman. You know how to run a boat. You know how to take the big, big nets and throw them in. And you've had big catches of fish. And that big catch of fish would, you know, you could pay the temple tax for all of us with a net full of fish. But Peter, you're going to throw in one line and you're going to deal with this one issue. And that's it. All right, we're going to stop there today. We're out of time. Father, we keep looking at the apostles and we see that they had little faith. But Lord, their faith grew and they changed the world. Sometimes, Father, we understand that and we see how little our faith is. But Lord, grow us like you grew the 12. Grow us, Lord. Let the Holy Ghost work on us. Teach us, guide us, train us. Grow us, Father. We want to change the world just like the 12. In Jesus' name, amen.